I don't know if you know it, but once there was a parade where I might have been called the Grand Marshal. It was a parade to honor me, believe it or not. And it was when I was in Jewel, Iowa, and they were in cahoots with Denise the night before. It was close to my birthday, and they pulled me out of bed, and they put me on, yes, a manure spreader. And some people think I've been spreading it all the years of my life. I remember that the manure spreader had one flat tire, so as I rode through the streets of Jewel at 6 a.m. with horns honking behind me, it was kind of like this. An unusual parade, wouldn't you say? And when circuses come to town, as they did in bygone years, the circus would go all through the city. You remember footage of these type of things? Maybe it happened here in Spencer too. When the circus comes to town, the clowns and the elephants and the acrobats and all the animals in cages would come through town. There'd be music. Why? So that you were aware that they were here and something significant was going to happen that you better come so you didn't miss it. Well, we're going to talk about a king who rode a donkey in a parade. An unusual king, no doubt. An unusual king for so many reasons. Not a powerful warrior riding as king in a show of power on a big stallion with the soldiers all full armored with their weapons marching behind like they could flex their muscles and take charge. No, the prophet Zechariah had foretold it, that Jesus would come into Jerusalem just the way he did, on the back of a donkey in humility, Riding a donkey's back? Is it a farce? These claims that he's the king when he's on the back of a donkey? And the children and the people are waving their branches and laying their cloaks down in front of him as a sign of their subjection to him? No. He is the king. And he rides into Jerusalem to absorb the world's evil and to take darkness into his own heart and to take all the sins and brokenness of the world on himself. He was the king. Hosanna means he saves. Hosanna means save us now. And the people just didn't understand fully what they needed to be saved from. And maybe you and I don't either. Sometimes we want to shout for King Jesus because we want a miracle. And I think that there was a whole segment in the crowd that day. Remember, it's just a few days since he raised Lazarus from the dead. Do you think people were talking about the fact that Lazarus, who lay in the tomb four days, was out and alive and eating and among them? So they were hoping that as Jesus rides his donkey into Jerusalem, they'd see more miracles. Show us your stuff, Jesus. Release your power to help me. I want to see the miracles again. And then there were people like Judas himself who wanted Jesus as king to come in as a political power to oust the Romans. And here's the truth. When I pray to Jesus Christ, I am also expecting and asking for miracles. And I want him to align my life like a political powerful figure. I want him to fix everything that I wish was different in my life. You too, I assume. 
So we still are thinking, I'd like a king who shows me his power. I'd like a king who always does a miracle when I pray for it. I want a king who's politically so powerful he can fix what's broken in the world. I want that kind of king. There's a quote that I read not long ago. The people didn't understand the nature of how they needed to be saved. And so here's the quote. A life preserver has no value to the one who doesn't know he's drowning. So they didn't see the value of Jesus because they didn't know that they needed to be saved in the way he came to save them. A life preserver has no value to the one who doesn't know he's drowning. But we need the type of king who came for us He's an unusual king coming into the city in this donkey parade because he weeps as he approaches Jerusalem. Why is he doing that? Why is the king weeping? Well, his heart is one with the people of Jerusalem. He knows the history of how Jerusalem has treated the prophets of God, killing them, stoning them, rejecting their message, living in defiance, living the way they wanted to live, as if there was no relationship or accountability to God. So he weeps because of the people's past rejection, but Jesus also is fully aware that their Hail Jesus, the King, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, will in a few days turn into people not lining the streets as he rides a donkey, but he's going to drag a wooden cross down the Via Della Rosa, and the people are going to line the streets crying, crucify him, get rid of him. He isn't the kind of king we want. Crucify him. He weeps because there will be a time where a sign over his head will still say, King of the Jews, but he'll be in the death throes. He weeps because their cheers will turn to jeers. He weeps because the people will turn on him. He weeps because his own disciples will forsake him. He weeps at the rejection. And still today, 21st century, 2100 years later, I believe Jesus Christ still weeps as his arms are open But people in our culture and in our world treat Jesus like he's irrelevant. A life preserver has no value unless you understand you're drowning. And he weeps that they would reject the love that he freely offers. And how many times do you and I approach each day living as if Jesus doesn't exist? So our king weeps. But we know also that he kneels down and washes feet. He takes the posture of a slave. He's a servant who washes feet. His power is upside down. He stands power on its head. And he uses the full extension of his power to serve you, to wash you. I like what Luther says about Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. He says he's a god with knuckles. Listen to his quote. The king rides into Jerusalem to extirpate sin. I'll get back to that weird word in a minute, extirpate. He rides into Jerusalem to extirpate sin, to knock death's teeth out, to gut the devil and rescue all who believe in him from sin and death. So he's riding in to prepare for battle and Luther's saying he's going to throw an unexpected right hook to death and he's going to take care of death knocking its teeth out by dying himself. So why should you and I praise this king in the donkey parade still today? Why should you and I still 
offer the Lord Jesus the praise he deserves. And I'm going to ask for your help so that each time I give you a reason, I want you to say with me, All hail King Jesus. Can we try that? Get your palm branches out, and on the count of three, let's try it. One, two, three. All hail King Jesus. I hope you do better as we go along. Okay. So here's the first reason that Jesus on the donkey parade is worthy of our praise. Because he's willing to go to the hard places and do the hard task for us. He doesn't try to weasel out. He doesn't run from his mission. He doesn't run from sacrificial death. He doesn't run from entering Jerusalem knowing that they're going to kill him. He does not run. He does the hard task. That's the first reason he's worthy of our praise. All hail King Jesus. Here's number two. Jesus as our king on a donkey's back is not fueled by people's praises, though that would be heady stuff. It could be seductive. In fact, he is motivated by a desire to obey his father and accomplish his mission, and he's motivated by a love for you. All Hail King Jesus. The third reason that this king on a donkey's back is worthy of our praise is that he is faithful, though I am fickle. I'm like riding a roller coaster up and down. I'm hot and cold. My loyalty sometimes dissipates like fog on a sunny, hot morning. But Jesus is perfectly faithful. That's the third reason. All hail King Jesus. Here's the fourth one. King Jesus riding the donkey's back is not repulsed by my failure. He doesn't look at me ever and say, that's it, Lavig, one too many times. I'm sick of your pathetic weakness. I'm tired of all your attitude. I'm sick of the disappointment that you never measure up. I'm done with you. He is not repulsed even when I am so imperfect. Remember Peter, his disciple, he made these bold professions over and over again about his undying loyalty that he'd never desert him. He'd die for him. But what happened to Peter? He denied him. He failed. And yet Jesus looked at him in love and said, Peter, I'll build the church upon you. That's the fourth reason we praise him. All hail King Jesus. Here's number five. The king who rides the donkey's back always follows through. He doesn't quit until he's accomplished the mission. In Luke chapter 9 verse 51, it says, Jesus set his face like flint could to go to Jerusalem. He set his face like stone in determination. He would not be detoured. He would do what the Father sent him to do. He may have in the Garden of Gethsemane lamented to his Father about in his human as he didn't want to go through with it. But we know that he hung on the cross and said these very words, It is finished. That's why he's a king on a donkey's back who deserves our praise. All hail King Jesus. Here's number six if you're counting. Jesus the king keeps every promise. I love the paragraph in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, every promise of God is yes in Jesus Christ. Will you say that with me? Every promise of God is yes in Christ is Christ. Christ Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? You should write that one on your mirror. Every promise that God has made to us is fulfilled and completed and will be kept and will be granted and the blessing will come. That's the sixth reason that we praise this king. All hail King Jesus. 
You're running out of gas. I hope I finish before you. Here's number seven, this king riding the donkey's back. He sacrificed his power and his privilege and his life for our personal need. The measure of a king's greatness is whether the king's manner of ruling is good for the subjects in the kingdom. This king, who rode the donkey's back, was willing to give up his power and let go of his privilege and empty himself of glory in order to do what we needed him to to do. He was not a victim of mob impetus or an accidental death. He laid down his life for his friends. And then he turns to you and says, you are my friends. That's the seventh reason that this king riding a donkey's back is worthy of our praise. Say it with me. All hail King Jesus. So now fast forward 50 years. And there's a city in Turkey, north of Jerusalem, that exceeds Jerusalem in size and maybe even in its glory in the way that it was created. Jerusalem now has been destroyed because they missed the time of God's visitation. But an earthquake destroyed Laodicea, a rich, affluent city in Turkey. It destroyed it. And the Roman emperor offered the city leaders of Laodicea financial money to help rebuild. Laodicea declined. We're going to do it ourselves. And in five years, they rebuilt the city of Laodicea after an earthquake. But the church of Laodicea is written about in Revelation chapter 3. And Jesus critiqued the church in Laodicea. They also, like the city, were rich and opulent and successful. They had everything. And in that time period, they were free in religion. They experienced no religious persecution. They had everything going for them. But according to what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, somehow in the machinery of the running of the church's rhythm, Jesus was no longer in their midst. Jesus somehow had been pushed out of the church and now was on the outside of the church, locked out. And Revelation 3, remember this verse? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. They had lost, as the church, they had lost their intimate connection with Jesus himself. And the spirit of Jesus was no longer welcomed within their midst. So Jesus now, what a hard image. We talk about it in terms of inviting Jesus into our hearts, but the truth is in Revelation 3, it's really talking about Jesus standing outside his church, a church once where he was vibrantly alive and at work and begging to be able to come back in. You see, it's always possible that the cheers turn to jeers. It's always possible that in our flawed expectation and understanding that we become disillusioned with God or we disconnect ourselves from the one who is, in fact, the king that we need. And so I want to end this morning by saying to you, this king who is worthy of our praise still comes in love and knocks on the heart door of every one of us and says, I love you. Can I be your king? Because if you'll open the door, I'm going to come in and we'll be together as friends. We'll walk together and I'll live in you and through you and I forgive your sin. That's why I came and I'll keep every promise. And we, the people of God, say, Say it one more time with me. All hail King Jesus. Amen.